Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining this class. It's a special class focused on growing microgreens and the importance of nutrition by eating healthy microgreens. My name is Uncle Shah and I'm the Director of Operations at Mycelium. And today's class is presented by SPORE, an out outreach program by the parent NGO called Mycelium. So a little bit about us, SPORE is a is an outreach program it, and it's full title is supporting public outreach resources and education. And our parent NGO is called Mycelium, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And our mission is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy and empower communities on a local level. We've done several projects ranging from creating a food system vision for 2050 for the city of Huntsville, Alabama, where, we're, where we are based. Then we have created a recycling corner that allows anyone to reuse and repurpose plastic waste to create their own customized design 3D printing, 3D printed object. So this is at a local university called the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And we are currently actively working on a project called an automated raised bed on a community garden to grow food automatically using a farm bot for aging and low income communities. So we believe in accelerating a circular economy, which is locally resilient and empowering communities in our area. So with that, I want to introduce Danica Abidjan, who is the owner of Sweet City Micros, a local business here in Huntsville, Alabama, that focuses on growing nutritious microgreens. And she's gonna go over why to grow microgreens and the importance of nutrition in general. So with that, let's welcome Danica and thank you so much for joining us again. I decided um, I wanted to do something that I was actually interested in. And um, after going back for my master's in sustainable food systems um, and a whole series of unfortunate events, <laughs> I ended up kind of stumbling um, into finding microgreens. Um, I was able to train underneath a former chef um, in Baltimore who had started his own microgreens business actually. And um, he, he taught me how to grow and, and how to get accounts with chefs and, and how to um, start at farmer's markets and, and all that jazz. So we've been in business for about three years now. Um, this coming year will be our fourth year. Um, Huntsville, Alabama is kind of um, unique onto itself within Alabama. So um, we have a number of government employees as well as a number of government contractors and people kind of coming from all over the country here. So that's kind of enabled us to um, be the first ones to bring microgreens to our area. But for those of you who are, you know, maybe in Arkansas or maybe in different parts of the world, um, maybe it's already established, maybe it's not. Maybe you guys are, are able to go down and get it from five different providers and, and maybe, you know, you're, you're just interested in just growing your own. Um, but yeah, so what, what we're going to kind of go over are the different benefits <clears throat> of microgreens and the, um, a lot of the details, I think that a lot of people aren't really aware of. Um, so starting out, so starting out, most people are kind of familiar with microgreens as a garnish, right? So usually, you know, if you do go into a restaurant or something and, and it's on a plate, it's just kind of pretty greenery that's, that's um, splashed on there at the last minute. Um, typically chefs will get them um, from larger sellers or producers like Fresh Point or Cisco. They're usually half rotted at the bottom. By the time you're getting them, they don't really have much nutrients or much taste to be frank. Um, so, when we sell ours, uh, we actually we actually encourage people to eat them living, like as, as soon as you've cut them. So, um, and this is a picture of microgreens that were just cut. So um, a lot of people are thinking they're just getting a garnish, but if you're getting them fresh, actually what you're getting is something that's extremely nutrient dense and something that you're able to add to whatever it is that you're already eating without having to make a lot of adjustments. So first off, what are microgreens, right? So most people kind of assume that uh, microgreens are the same thing as sprouts. Um, it's actually not true. So microgreens are basically just a stage of growth. That's all it is. It's not any different 
from any other plant. Microgreen is any edible plant where the whole thing is edible um, basically within its early stage of growth. So sprouts are, um, you know, like typically one to seven days old. Um, if you're eating sprouts, you're eating the roots, um, you're eating the seed hull, and then you're eating um, the stems and leaves that have just kind of started to come out. Microgreens are going to be the next stage past that. So microgreens are um, the cotyledon leaves um, have already come out, which are basically the embryonic leaves. Um, and then sometimes they'll sell them with the true leaves is what they're called. They're, they're the second set of leaves. And um, typically you're not eating the roots, you're not eating the seed hulls. Um, so, and then past that, you know, are gonna be the baby greens and then past that would be the maturity. So um, here what we have are just, you know, a couple of pictures of the different stages. So you guys can kind of see, you know, this is what broccoli looks like as sprouts, you know, over here on the left hand. And then the next is microgreens. And then all the way there on the right, you can see um, the maturity stage and the um, flowering stage, but that's all the same plant. You know, it's, it's, it's not anything different. It's the same seeds, it's all the same plant. So um, this is kind of just a close up shot. So that way you can see a little bit better. Um, so again, if you were to eat peas as um, a sprout, you know, like a lot of the times people are eating the, um, the seed as it's just germinating, whereas the microgreen is it's more of a plant form. So you're, you're getting more mass, um, more bang for your buck, I guess you could say. Um, as you can see here, it's on the left hand side for the sprouts, it's, it's just the seed with um, the roots starting to come out. And whereas over here on the right hand side where the microgreens are, it's already got stems, it's already got leaves and it's already got roots and it actually looks, you know, like a plant growing into something. So um, what we get a lot of questions about is um, how are they not, how are they not the same thing? I mean, how do you delineate? Um, so I just put something in here really quickly um, just for anybody who is interested in you know growing maybe not just for themselves but um, maybe for a wider audience wherever they are um, the us if you're in the us has just recently passed the food safety modernization act where um, they did delineate the difference between microgreens and sprouts before there was no real legislation that um, that listed any kind of difference um, this is this is the thing that has listed the difference though. And basically it's saying, if you're eating the cotyledons or again, those embryonic leaves um, and they are uh, developed, um, if you're using a substrate, um, so that's like soil or coconut core or um, maybe like a hemp substrate or something um, and you're not eating the roots, then it's going to be a microgreen. But um, if it doesn't have a substrate, if you're eating the root hall, the roots, and um, those cotyledon leaves have not been developed yet, then um, they're going to be classified as a sprout. So um, if for any of those who are interested in um, even just selling at farmer's markets or something, that that is an important delineation something for you to know because there's far more <laughs> requirements for, um, for sprouts than, um, than there are for um, microgreens, just safety-wise. Um, and the reason, the reason for that is that in the past, um, when people have eaten sprouts, um, they have gotten sick just because uh, if there's going to be any bacteria, it's going to be on the roots. Um, so if you're selling microgreens, um, people are not eating the roots. So you're not likely to have that um, bacterial con contamination, even if you're just growing it for yourself at home. Um, if you're doing, if you're making sprouts, then um, you're probably going to be putting them in a jar, the seeds in a jar, right? And then um, just repeatedly um, wetting them or getting them damp and um, causing them to germinate that way. Um, with microgreens, that's not the case. You're, you're keeping them out of the water. You're giving them a lot more airflow. And um, again, you're not eating the roots of the seed hull. So any of that bacteria is um, much less likely to be a problem. And so they've actually never had a, a nationwide recall in the US. 
um, for just sprouts or for just microgreens, excuse me, but they've had a number of them for sprouts. And um, so you've actually seen a lot of recalls for sprouts, but um, microgreens, that hasn't been the case, which is why I personally decided uh, to go into microgreens. I felt like it was the safer food that was still nutrient dense. So um, since we're brandishing around these words like nutrient density, um, kind of let's go over the difference between what nutrient dense is versus what's healthy versus um, kind of what most people's overall quote unquote goal is, at least here in the US, is low calorie. So um, we've kind of been brainwashed to believe if something is low calorie or low fat, then um, that's what we want. Well, the problem with that is, is your body actually needs calories to do things, right? So, um, so really what we need to be aiming for is nutrient density. And what nutrient density is, is how much nutrients is within um, a small amount of food, right? So if you're able to fit a lot of nutrients into a smaller amount of food, that means that you're not having to eat nearly as much of that food as you would if it, um, if it wasn't nutrient dense. So most people think of what's healthy as, okay, well, it doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. It doesn't have a lot of fat in it. Um, it doesn't have a lot of chemicals in it. So therefore I'm getting all of the nutrients that I need. Well, a lot of the times that's not the case. Um, so even if you are getting those calories, people think, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the negative stuff. So therefore I'm getting what, what I need. Well, no, well, what you need are, are vitamins, what you need are nutrients, what you need is um, something that's bioavailable as well, something that your body can break down. And the nice thing about microgreens is that um, they allow for that. So you're not having to eat nearly as much in order to get the same amount of nutrients as you would if it was um, a mature plant. So um, microgreens are actually up to 40 times more nutrient dense by weight um, than their mature plant. Um, also, um, from just a, a sustainable standpoint, um, they found that like say the average broccoli takes um, up to 158 to 236 times less water um, to grow nutritionally what would be equivalent um, to the mature vegetable. So it's less time, it's less energy, it's less um, materials, it's less space, obviously. Um, we grow in an eight by 10 room um, in order to, to provide our city with microgreens, whereas most farmers are using acres and acres of land. Um, but because they're so nutrient dense, because you know it, it is up to 40 times more nutrient dense by weight, that means that you're cutting off a little bit and putting it on not just a salad, but say you're putting it on your hamburger you're putting it on your soup, you're putting it on your eggs in the morning, you're putting it on whatever it is that you're already eating and you're getting all of those vitamins um, that are bioavailable um, within that plant um, as opposed to, you know, say if you're, if you're just eating meat, you know, like you're, you're mostly just concentrated on the protein and the amino acids, but you're not necessarily getting all the extra vitamins that that you might need to be getting. Um, so the stage of growth matters um, as far as how nutrient dense something is. So when you're turning a seed into a plant, what you're doing is you're actually deactivating those enzyme inhibitors that are within a seed because a seed does not want to be digested, right? Um, if a bird eats a seed, then that seed wants to be able to protect itself. So that way, when the bird excretes it, it will be able to grow into a plant. So seeds naturally have um, in inhibitors in it to keep them from being digested, like uh, phytic acid. So um, when you're turning a seed into a plant and turning it into a microgreen, what you do is you actually activate um, enzymes and you unlock the nutrients and minerals that are endowed within that seed because that seed has everything in it to become a plant, right? It, it, it has that, um, 
that nutrient um, bundle, I guess we'll say, or nutrient package to, to make itself into a plant, but you're not able to access all of that as a seed. So um, when you're eating it at such a young age, it's so condensed because it hasn't had time to fill up with water and to fill up with fiber. Those nutrients aren't nearly as dispersed and you're able to basically eat it in a much more concentrated package. So it's much more efficient. Um, and you'll see that uh, a little bit later on with broccoli. Um, but basically the biggest study that people use to, to justify these claims, if you're curious, is the uh, 2012 university study um, that was done by Maryland uh, um, here in the US. So what they did is they took 25 different microgreens and um, they compared their nutrients to their mature plants. And what they thought that they were going to find was that they were um, somewhat similar or maybe that microgreens were, would be a little bit more nutrient dense, but they found out that in every single comparison, they were either at the very least equal to, if not greater than um, the mature plants and nutrients. Um, and, and they found that each one of these different microgreens, because they are different plants, would provide different amounts of vitamins and nutrients. Um, so if you're looking for protein, for example, you know, you would go to pea shoots, they're a complete protein. If you were looking for vitamin C, then you would go to um, red cabbage, for example. So each one has different um, vitamins in them and different taste profiles as well. But so this is the big study in the US specifically that um, kind of proved um, how nutrient dense microgreens are. So for example, like I'd said, um, vitamin C, um, that's something that helps form collagen, it helps repair tissue, it helps boost your immune system, um, it helps pre pre um, prevent gout. Um, they found with red garnet amaranth, it was actually 11 times higher. With um, purple radish, it was one and a half times its daily allowance required, you know, needed for um, vitamin C. With red cabbage, um, it was for or 2.4 times higher than the average requirement. Um, with vitamin K, again, same thing, it's much higher. So vitamin K is essential to blood clotting, uh, bone metabolism, um, improving your calcium absorption. So it's great to take with calcium. Um, so like red sorrel was eight times higher than the mature leaf. Red cabbage was actually seven times higher than the mature leaf. So extremely nutrient dense in vitamin K. And the red garnet amaranth uh, was three times higher. So it was still um, quite a bit higher than the mature leaf. Um, beta carotene, which is the precursor to vitamin A, um, that's what you need for healthy skin, healthy eyes. Um, cilantro is great for beta carotene. Um, so is red cabbage. Again, that one massively more concentrated in beta carotene than the mature leaf. Red cabbage was 260 times higher than the mature leaves. Um, pea shoots, um, also high in beta carotene. And the great thing about this is a lot of the times people are cooking um, their vegetables. So red cabbage in particular, a lot of the times people are cooking red cabbage when they're eating it. So they're already boiling out a lot of the nutrients or steaming out a lot of the nutrients. Um, that are available. So even if you were eating red cabbage, um, you probably wouldn't be getting that beta carotene if you're eating it in the mature form, but because you're eating it as a microgreen and you're not cooking it, um, not only are you getting that beta carotene, but you're actually getting much, much more than you would be getting from um, if you're just eating uh, the mature uh, red cabbage raw. Uh, lutein, a lot of people aren't really familiar with this uh, vitamin, but actually it's essential to eye health. It's also very essential to cognitive health. So they actually um, did testing on high school and college students. And they found that a lot of those students that did well on the tests had much higher levels of lutein in their system, as opposed to the students who um, scored lower in the testing. So they found that it's very essential to cognitive health. Um, so again, cilantro, higher than the maturity, mature leaf by three times. Um, 
red vein sorrel was very high in lutein, and then red cabbage was again 260 times higher um, than the mature cabbage. And then vitamin E, which protects our cells from free radicals and clots forming in your arteries, um, is very high in uh, purple radish in particular. They tested different kinds of radish, uh, like daikon radish, um, and then I think China, China red rose, but um, purple radish they found in particular to be very high in vitamin C, also in cilantro, and then the red cabbage, it was 40 times more nutrient dense. So um, in particular, the kind of star that I guess most people are more most familiar with as far as microgreens are concerned is um, broccoli. And that's because the most research has been, has been done on broccoli over the years. Um, so Dr. Paul uh, Talele, a John Hopkins scientist discovered that within broccoli sprouts and microgreens, that they contained up to 10 to 100 times more sulforaphane in it than the mature broccoli. Um, so what is sulforaphane? Sulforaphane is um, basically an antioxidant that they found is very, very potent in killing and preventing cancer from spreading. Um, it basically acts as a security guard for your cell um, to keep it, to protect it from free radicals. So they say that your cells are um, exposed to free radicals up to 40,000 times a day. So um, the sulforaphane is extremely um, efficient at protecting your cells from free radicals. And the great thing about sulforaphane is when you do things like uh, crush it up, if you put it um, in a blender, say, you're actually compounding that um, the effects of sulforaphane. So you're actually increasing it even more so. Um, so broccoli in particular, um, as a microgreen, they found um, an ounce of micro broccoli equals 20 ounces of the mature broccoli. So, and, and again, you don't need 20 ounces of mature broccoli in order to meet your daily requirement. Um, I think when I, I did the math a few months ago, it was, you need about four ounces or five ounces of um, mature broccoli in order to you know meet your daily requirement. And so um, that breaks it down to basically like a handful of broccoli microgreens and you're meeting um, your daily requirement um, for all of the nutrients that you would need from broccoli. They've also found that broccoli in particular will help um, prevent many chronic diseases. Um, so they did a study, I think in 2014, where they found that eating not just broccoli, but anything that's a crucifer, so broccoli, kale, um, cabbage, anything that's going to be high in sulforaphane it, it, um, is a crucifer. And so um, they found eating these crucifers will actually um, prevent your likelihood of getting chronic diseases like um, heart disease or cancer or diabetes by 60%. So, um, and that's four times a month. And that was with the mature plants. That wasn't even with microgreens. So if you're eating microgreens, which we've you know already gone over is up to 40 times more nutrient dense, you can imagine how much you'd be decreasing your likelihood of getting those chronic illnesses even more. Um, so, uh, we're, we're going to kind of hit the pause button for a minute. Um, how fresh is fresh if we're talking about eating vegetables in general, whether it's mature, whether it's microgreens, whatever, how fresh is fresh? So um, they've done a number of studies um, over the 2000s, um, I think early 2000s, maybe 2005, 2006 is when they started really releasing the studies, but um, they started looking at the different um, ages of um, produce on the shelves. How long is it since your produce has been picked um, to when it gets to the shelf? How long does it stay on the shelf until you're getting it home and eating it? And why is this important? Well, this is important because when you pick something or when you take it from its life source, so its roots, when you dig it up or when you cut it from its stem, it actually begins to degrade in nutrients. So um, it is relatively important how fresh your food is. If it's um, got some age on it, it's not going to be very nutrient dense. 
So um, they found overall um, apples and vegetables, obviously they were the longest. So um, they were up to a year since they had been picked to when they were on the grocery store shelves. Um, I cannot imagine <laughs> how much nutrients is left if something's been picked and sitting around for a year. Um, they found that a number of vegetables were um, up, to, up to several months old. Um, they found that even the, the leafy lettuces were um, up to several weeks old. So a lot of the, unless you're growing your own food or unless you are getting it from farmers who you know at your local farmer's markets or within your communities, um, a lot of the stuff you're getting from the grocery store, it just, it's not fresh. Um, a lot of it's, you know, as we know, being imported in from multiple different countries, um, even though we have the capacity to grow them often within our, our own communities or communities, you know, around us or um, nearby. So with microgreens in particular, they found that when you cut them or when you harvest them, um, they are, they begin to rapidly uh, degrade nutrients just because they are, you know, they're babies. So um, after they, you've cut microgreens, 30 minutes after refrigeration, it's already lost, I think it was 80% of its nutrients. Um, so when you think about buying the pre-cut microgreens in the store, um, they're going to be out of refrigeration for more than 30 minutes, right? Say even if it was refrigerated the entire time after um, they've, been, they've been cut and washed and packaged and shipped to the grocery store and um, gotten onto the shelf, say best case scenario, they've, they've haven't been outside of refrigeration for more than 30 minutes then. By the time you've taken it off the shelf and put it in your cart and then walked around the store and gotten the 5,000 other things that you needed and reined your kids in because they're going crazy as well and standing in line and then putting it in the car and getting home, they've definitely been out of the refrigerator for more than 30 minutes. So um, I always recommend the best way to eat microgreens is um, having them right there, having them living and um, cutting them and harvesting them yourself because then you know when it was harvested, you know what was put on them, um, you know that they're fresh. Most pre-cut microgreens that you're getting in the store, they're actually required to be washed um, typically in a bleach solution um, here in the US anyways. Um, in order to kill anything that, um, you know, might, might grow on it just because, you know, you've cut it. And so now it's, it's basically an open wound in the plant and bacteria can now get in. So, um, so yeah, so they're actually required to, to wash them in, in a bleach solution. And um, as most of you can imagine, that's going to kill a lot of the nutrients right there, you know, with that, that, you would even be buying the microgreens for. So um, another question that I get a lot um, just from, from my customers at the farmer's markets is, um, but am I gonna get full eating microgreens? Um, I mean, if you just wanna heap an entire plate of microgreens and try to live off of that, you're free to do so, um, you know, have at it. But I encourage people to eat it with what you're already eating because that's where you're going to get your most benefit because then you're going to be eating it more often. So, you know, you can put it on eggs, you can put it on soup, you can put it on um, potatoes, you can put it on tacos. I'm actually in love with micro cilantro. Um, so putting it on tacos has, has probably been one of my biggest uses. Um, but you can put it on sandwiches, you can put it on wraps, uh, you can put it on casseroles, you can put it in smoothies. There are a lot of people, um, myself included, that I know that put um, things like broccoli um, in smoothies because it is so, as a microgreen, not to mature broccoli, but as a microgreen, it is much more mild in flavor. And so if you put it in a fruit smoothie, um, it will actually um, just, just taste like fruit. Just like if you um, put spinach in it or something, it's it's not a strong tasting microgreen. 
So, and, and like we discussed before with the sulfur fame, um, when you're blending it, you're actually increasing um, the amount of sulfur fame in there uh, if you're using broccoli microgreens. So um, you're boosting up your smoothie even more so. So there's lots of different ways to get microgreens and because they are um, so nutrient dense, you are like much more likely to stay full longer if you're eating it with your food, right? Because what makes you feel hungry? You feel hungry because your body is actively, you know, needing nutrients. It's, it's asking you to give it nutrients. So if you're eating something that is nutrient dense, your body is going to get full faster. And so it's not going to get hungry as quickly. Um, which is why, you know, you can sit there and eat an entire bag of chips and then still be hungry and be surprised when, you know, you're looking down into an empty bag versus, you know, if you're eating um, something that's much more hearty, you know, like a bowl of soup or something, you, you're going to find that a lot more filling because there's a lot more nutrients in that. Um, so um, another interesting thing that I found with microgreens is that, you um, once I've eaten it for a few days in a row, I wouldn't even say a week for me personally, I would say when I first started eating microgreens, about three days, maybe four at the most, but three days after I've eaten them consistently. Um, so that means eating them like on like two meals out of the day for like three to four days. I found that I actually started to crave them um, because my body was craving that nutrients. And I actually, um, in, in contrast to that, did not crave um, sweets. I didn't crave um, things high in sugar. Um, and this is somebody who has a very, very big sweet tooth and a serious uh, addiction to chocolate that actually should probably be looked at by professionals. So um, I found that microgreens will actually change your cravings as far as food is concerned, just because it is so nutrient dense. And, um, and but that's true for just about any nutrient dense food, it will, it will change your body's cravings. But um, microgreens I found is probably one of the easiest nutrient dense foods to put into your diet in order to accomplish that. Um, microgreens are also fantastic for healing your gut. So um, because you've negated that phytic acid or those enzyme inhibitors like we talked about before, um, your body's actually going to be able to break down and absorb those nutrients at a much easier rate than even if you were just eating raw mature vegetables, right? And um, so they're much easier to absorb. And also if you're eating it with other food, what you're going to do is because they are so high in enzymes, it's actually going to help you break down that food much easier. So say you put microgreens on a steak and you eat it with a steak, your body will have an easier time breaking down that meat because you have those microgreens and those extra enzymes versus if you just ate that steak by itself. Um, so I have a number of customers actually who they've had issues in the past um, with that sensitivity and different food sensitivities and they were working on healing their gut. And so, um, they found in particular microgreens, um, specifically the crucifers like broccoli and kale and cabbage and um, kohlrabi, those in that vein have, have really helped with um, healing their gut and um, getting them to where they were able to eat other foods again that for a while they hadn't been able to eat just because their body was able to absorb nutrients um, from the microgreens and kind of start getting it back to um, a stable a stable point. So um, for those of you who are interested in growing your own microgreens, um, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. You can do it um, you can do it in soil as a substrate um, or you know a growing platform or you can do it uh, hydroponically so say, with coconut core or um, with hemp mats. Um, there's, a, there's a number of um, other non-soil um, options out there. I've seen people even use paper towels, like wet paper towels and, and use it. I don't know how successful you would be with a, num with a range of, um, of seeds doing paper towel method, but um, soil for sure. 
um, it's probably the easiest or even just ground up coconut core um, if, you, if you can't get your hands on the mats. So what I would do um, if you're just wanting to do it on your counter is um, take some seed starting soil, right? So you want, you want um, sto soil that's um, kind of sterile. You want soil that um, it's the, the seeds aren't having to compete with, right? Um, so probably for this, don't go to your compost, don't go to your compost bin and just take it um, out of your compost bin, get something that, um, or, if, or if it has been composted, make sure that you've, you've done, um, you've done the method where you've, you've heated it up to the point to where it's, you know, pretty much sterilized everything out. But, um, so take a scoop of soil or, um, you know, ground up coconut core that you've hydrated and put it in kind of a flat, like, um, container. So what you can see here in the pictures are Pyrex dishes, glass Pyrex dishes. Those are great. If you don't have those, if you just have um, take plastic takeout containers, those are absolutely fine too. Just put it in there, spread out the soil um, to where it's level. You only really need like an inch of that. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the seeds and you're going to kind of sprinkle it evenly um, across the soil or across your substrate. Um, you want to make sure that it's pretty densely seeded. So you don't want the seeds on top of each other to where, you know, they're, they're all just piled on top of each other because then it's not going to germinate correctly. But you, you want them to basically just kind of be touching each other and you want to cover all of the soil like that. And then what you'll do is you'll just take a spray bottle and um, squirt the spray bottle with, uh, or squirt the seeds with, with the spray bottle and do that until everything is um, nice and moist. And then you want to kind of put a cover over it. You don't want to, um, you don't want to do it in such a way that no air is getting into it. So you would just want to take a cover and put over it just so that way it's, it's kind of keeping the moisture in. And I would spray the inside of the top cover as well, just to really keep that moisture in. And then um, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna let it germinate. So you will, allow it to germinate for, depending on what it is, um, say if it's broccoli or if it's radish, you'll allow it to germinate um, in on the counter for, I would say four to five days, probably, maybe six if it's cold, like if it's winter, like now, I would say um, maybe six days, but four to five days typically, maybe a little bit less in the summer. And you're just going to water it every day to keep it moist. Um, once the stems have reached the point where it's reached the cover and it's kind of pushing the cover off, you'll take the cover off and um, put it in the sun, put it underneath the light or something. The sun should be fine though, in direct light um, by a sunny window is fine. And um, let it let it go into the vegetative state. So just let it sit in the lights and that will maybe take another um, three to four days, depending on, you know, if it's radish or if it's broccoli, um, and, you know, continue to water it, continue to, um, water it kind of from the side though. I wouldn't necessarily water it from the top because as you can see from this picture, a lot of, um, a lot of these leaves are very densely planted. And so if you're watering it from the top, then what's happening is you're trapping all of that moisture in between those leaves, in between those stems, and that can cause mold. And um, so that's kind of when you see the fails <laughs> that people um, might put up in their YouTube videos. Why is this happening? So um, I, I would kind of water it from the side. Try to try to put water in. Um, don't spray it. Um, just pour some water in from the side of the container, and um, make sure that there's enough for the roots, you know, to kind of stay moist. And um, so all in all. If it's like broccoli or radish, it will probably take between six to 10 days in order to have mature, or in order to have, you know, microgreens at the point where you want to eat them. And then you can just cut them as you go. And you've got them right there on your counter. You know that they're fresh. You know you haven't put anything on them. You know that they're nutrient dense. And what you can do is you can, um, you know, plant in succession, right? So as you've got some that are germinating after, you know, they've gotten to the point where they've germinated and you're about to, um, put those ones in the sun, then you can take out another container and plant another container. And um, so then by the time those ones are ready, then the second, um, the second batch that you've planted is now going to be done germinating and will go out in the sun. So that way you can have a continuous supply of microgreens. Um, 
and that's I mean really that's what I do is I we grow ours hydroponically but I just keep a pad of our on the counter and I just um, pull them out of the pad or, or cut them off um, just as I'm about to use them I just mine in the kitchen and uh, that way I use them and I remember them as opposed to you know keeping them elsewhere in the house um, so if you are local if there's anybody that's here that's local in Huntsville um, you can order online um, on our website, what we do um, is we have people order by Thursday night, and then on Fridays you can either pick up at one of our locations or we deliver within our Huntsville area. Um, we also work closely with a local CSA here called Duncan Farms. So um, what they do, if you're not familiar with the CSA, is it's called Community Supported Agriculture, and they um, you you pay them. Um, an amount, I think twice a month. And then what they do is they've partnered with local growers and other local farms and they bring you uh, a grocery bag or a, a box of um, goodies that off of their farm and other people's farms. So you get eggs, you get meat, you get, you know, whatever's coming off of their farm and whatever they're putting in our boxes. So over the winter, um, we're going to be partnering with them. So for anybody who is interested in starting their own um, microgreens, you know, company if you're elsewhere, um, that's also something that you can do. You can have people order online, you can deliver to them yourself, or um, you can partner with other farms and uh, be able to utilize um, their customer base as well. So um, for us, we're really big on um, collaboration and coordination as opposed to competition. So um, if you're able to um, even just trade with other neighbors, you know, if, if you're growing microgreens for more than just yourself and you're, you know, growing several batches, I'm sure that you could probably trade with other neighbors, you know, for what's in their garden if you're growing microgreens. So um, there's a lot of different, a lot of different uses when you're growing your own food, right? Um, so the biggest, the biggest takeaway, I guess, um, is if you're going to be looking for nutrient-dense food, if you're going to be looking for a way that's easy to change your diet, to be able to um, change your food cravings, if you're able to, or looking for a way to get a lot more vitamins um, into what it is that you're already eating, uh, microgreens are an excellent way to do that without um, some of the associated risks of say like sprouts or um, other, other avenues. But, um, but yeah, so I guess we'll open it up for questions if anybody is curious about anything else. Awesome, Danica. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome talk. And we do have quite a few questions from the audience in the chat. So um, I can get started with uh, Nancy who asked when you were showing the vitamin E slide, uh, I guess she was making sure red cabbage has 40 times more is 40 times more nutrient dense than mature red cabbage. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yes. So, yeah, so the red cabbage, it's 40 times more nutrient dense than the mature red cabbage. Great. So, so yeah, I hope Nancy, if, if that's clarified, you, you, everyone can unmute themselves and interrupt or ask questions. So feel free to do that. Um, Jacob has a really good question. From a nutritional standpoint, the crude or raw micros maintain more nutrition than cooked. So how significant is the drop if, uh, say, you saute the microgreens? Okay, so um, that is a good question. You're right, I should have gone over that. So um, I found that with microgreens, it, it really kind of depends on the microgreen. So I would not encourage cooking just about any of them. The only ones that really stand up to cooking them, like sauteing them, for example, or stir frying them, would be the really hardy ones like pea shoots or sunflower shoots. Um, those ones are a little bit hardier, it seems like. And so um, just from other people that I've talked to that have actually looked at you know, the nutrient profile underneath, uh, you know, testing. Um, there's still a drop anytime you're, you know, applying any kind of significant heat to it, obviously, because that's how it is with most vegetables. But, um, but yeah, if you're cooking them for just about any of the rest of them, um, you're destroying a good amount of the nutrients if you're, if you're going to be, you know, say stewing them in a soup or something like that. So the way I would, um, I would eat them or the way that, that I add them to my dishes is if I am eat, eating soup, say, then I'll go ahead and I'll dish it up. And now that it's, I've already put it in the bowl, then I'll top up with the microgreens like right before I eat it. 
And then that way um, it's exposed to little heat, obviously, because your food is hot, but you're not sitting there cooking it and leaching out um, a lot of that, that nutrition that you're after. Great answer. Uh, so Jacob, if you have any follow-up uh, or if that answered, uh, please, please let us know. Feel free to unmute. Jenna, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question about, uh, you mentioned that the, the, the broccoli microgreens have a milder flavor. Uh, mm -hmm. So that just made me curious, uh, how would you quickly kind of rate all the microgreens as far as flavor? Are there some that are just like really bitter? Um, yeah, so, um, so for example, like we, everybody grows, you know, grower grows, you know, are growing different kinds, but um, so cilantro tastes pretty similar to mature cilantro. Um, radish is much spicier to me anyways than the mature radishes. Um, so anybody who's looking for a kick, I would definitely say radish. Same thing with arugula. I found that micro arugula is um, much spicier than the mature arugula. Um, pea shoots um, are sweeter. So people who are kind of just dipping their toe into it and are, um, you know, kind of afraid <laughs> of something bitter or, or, you know, that green taste, I definitely um, push them more towards pea shoots because they tend to kind of taste like snap peas. Mm. Um, and, and kids really love them because they've got a nice crunch to them. Mm. Um, sunflower shoots, uh, they're nutty. So, and they've got a really nice crunch to them. So those are really, really popular. Um, they're great on salads. They're great on sandwiches. They're great on wraps. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned you like the cilantro microgreens. Are they, how would they hold up to the mature plant? Um, as far as nutrients? Of just flavor, just, uh, oh, just do flavor. they have more um, of that that flavor or is it yeah different? I find I, I mean I find that it's pretty similar but it is a little bit more um, I don't, intense I guess um, for lack of a better word um, as if you'll notice in the picture um, here where it says cilantro um, you'll see a little bit of the coriander on there um, mm -hmm. and that's just that's just the way that the cilantro grows. We actually grow with a split seed instead of a whole seed. So um, most of the coriander comes off, but because there's a little bit of coriander on there, um, mm -hmm. it kind of echoes the flavor throughout, um, which I like personally, but also I love cilantro. So <laughs> mm -hmm. um, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Robin has a really good question. Are organic seeds healthier? And can you mix a variety of seeds in one tree? If so, where do you get the seeds? All right, so, um, okay. So it's a multi, multi-answer question. Okay, so starting out with are organic seeds healthier? So your seed source is important. However, I will caveat that with saying they don't necessarily need to be organic, right? So um, the quality of the seed is going to largely be determined on um, the health of the mother plant, right? And that's going to be determined on the soil. So um, so if, if the soil that the plant comes from um, is, is very nutrient dense, then it's going to grow a healthy plant and that healthy plant is going to grow nutrient dense seeds. Um, so we in particular source from, um, um, they've changed their name recently, um, Mountain Valley Seeds. Um, and we source from them because they go to every single farm and check out every single farm to, to look and see what their growing practices are, um, you know, if, if they're using anything on there. Uh, we use non-GMO seeds, we use organic seeds when we can. The issue that I have um, with the organic certification is that just because something is organic does not necessarily mean that um, the soil that they're growing in is nutrient dense. You know, um, they're still able to use a number of different um, fertilizers that um, I feel can be somewhat questionable. So just because something has an organic rating um, doesn't necessarily mean that the, the seeds are better quality. You kind of want to know the provider of the seeds. And if, um, and, and, and you can look at the germination rate as well. So any seeds that you order, it's going to say what the germination rate is. So it might say 85%, it might say 90%, it might say 95%. Um, but so you could be getting organic seeds and it only have like an 80% germination rate. Whereas you could be getting non-GMO seeds 
and it has a 95% um, germination rate, which means 95% of those seeds are going to germinate versus you know, the other ones where you know, only 80% of them are going to germinate. Um, and when you're planting really densely, that's important because if the seeds are sitting there rotting at the bottom because they haven't germinated, then you're a lot more likely to have mold issues as well. So. Awesome, thank you, Danica. And uh, yeah, mixing a variety of seeds in one tree. Um, yeah, so um, if you're going to mix a variety of seeds, um, really the requirement is they need to have all the similar growing time, right? So as I was talking about before with the broccoli and the radish, um, as far as growing your own, um, broccoli and radish are going to have different germination times and they're going to have different growing times. So say you're trying to grow broccoli and, and radish within the same tray, it's not going to work very well because the radish is going to get bigger and it's going to want to come out of germination a few days faster than the broccoli. And so um, you're going to be trying to play catch up and you're going to be trying to play a waiting game to get the broccoli, you know, to where it's ready to go under the lights or go under the sun um, while that um, the radish is, is, has been ready for a few days and that can sometimes cause mold, mold issues. So ones that do have similar rates would be say broccoli and kale, they do well together. Um, or like a lot of the crucifers, you know, broccoli, kale, cabbage. Um, we do a spring mix and it has five different um, kinds in it. I believe it's broccoli, cabbage, kohlrabi, arugula, and kale. Um, and so it's got a little bit of a bite from the arugula, but you're getting five different vegetables and we grow it all in one tray because they have similar germination times and similar vegetative times. Awesome. Thank you, Danica. Robin, does that answer your question? Um, just let us know. Now, yes, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jacob has a question. Uh, do you grow some microgreens for it to maturity from four seed or, oh, four seeds. So if you, if you grow some to maturity for seeds for the microgreens, and has there been any selection of characteristics specific to making the plants well suited to being microgreens in terms of uh, example flavor. So if you select characteristics and if you grow to maturity for the seeds. Yeah, so, um, so as far as for the maturity for the seeds, um, I've had a number of people ask about that. The thing is, is that when you're planting with micro, when you're sourcing seeds um, for microgreens or planting them, if you were just doing it for, you know, say to keep on your counter, um, you could, but the thing is, is you're planting so densely, you're going through a large amount of seed. So when we're buying seed, when we're sourcing seed, we're sourcing it by the pound. Um, most farmers that I know might buy a pound of something, you know, for a whole season. Um, and they're growing on acres of land. Um, whereas I am buying by the pound. And so um, because I'm planting so densely, I go through a lot more seed. And so if I were to try to grow something, you know, say in my yard for, you know, up to maturity in order to get the seeds, the amount of time, effort, and work that it would take in order to do that, in order to source my own seed, it just wouldn't be worth it. So for us, it's not viable. Um, but there are a number, obviously, you know, because those are the providers, but there are a number of farms that that's, you know, all that they concentrate on. They don't grow to maturity for harvesting. If they're growing it, they're growing it strictly to source the seed in order to be seed providers. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? I, I forgot. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Uh, so the other part is, has there been any selection of characteristics specific to making the plants well suited to being microgreens uh, in terms of example is flavor? So if you select yeah. any characteristics, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so if we're talking about individual plants, um, yeah, so like I said, for um, an overall rule, obviously in order for it to be a microgreen, the whole plant has to be edible. So for example, you can't do a pepper microgreen, right? 
because pepper plants, the plant itself is not edible. Only the pepper fruit is edible. Same thing with tomatoes. You could not do a tomato microgreen because the plant itself is toxic. So first and foremost, you know, the whole plant has to be edible. So if you're growing it, you know, for yourself or for other people, please do the research and don't just start planting seeds and go, this will be great. Mm -hmm. um, because just because it's a vegetable does not necessarily mean it can be a microgreen. Um, so all of the ones that we've listed in this presentation, all of those um, can be microgreens. Um, I wanna say there are definitely microgreens that I prefer more than others. Um, so for me, for example, um, I, like I said, I really, really like the micro cilantro just because I, I like the intensity of flavor. Um, I'm not as crazy about the micro radish. However, a lot of my customers are who really, really like spicy, spicy foods. Um, so, and then there's also different, different ones that they might not grow into very big leaves or they might be more prone to mold or to rot, right? So I know a lot of growers who they don't bother with micro arugula, for example, because it's extremely prone to mold or it's extremely prone to rot. Um, there's a lot of growers that I know that they don't bother with um, sunflower seeds, with, with growing sunflower shoots. And we've kind of dialed back on our sunflower shoots this year just because it's really, really hard to be able to get um, reliant seeds. So one year you might get an excellent lot of seeds and um, you know they germinate right every time and you don't really have any mold and, and you know they grow quickly and they're fantastic. And then the next year when you go to reorder seeds, it's a terrible lot and half of them don't germinate and then the other half mold before you're even able to you know, harvest them to you know, eat yourself or to sell to your customers. So, um, so yeah, there's a number of different characteristics to look at, um, not just with taste, but um, especially with growing and how well they grow and how well they hold up and how well they, um, you know, they'll last after you've grown them. So what, what sort of disadvantages does red cabbage have? Because it seems like it has a lot of advantages in the nutrition department, but does it taste bad or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it tastes bad. Um, it is, um, it does taste like cabbage. So, you know, I mean, it does have that very green kind of a mm. taste. So um, for those who are kind of like, I want to eat microgreens because I don't like vegetables. I don't, red cabbage is not the one that I firstly push them towards just because it is a very green tasting one. But um, mm. like you just said, it is very, very nutrient dense and has a lot of nutritional advantage. So if you're really just after it to get, to get your, you know, your nutrients, then just eat, you know, suck it up, just eat the red cabbage, you'll be fine. Um, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't have a bad taste. It's just very green. Yeah, thank you. I think there's one final question in the audience from Robin. Uh, how long do seeds stay good? So a good quality seed um, will, will stay viable for years. Um, a lot of it has to do with storage. So what you want to do is you want to keep it in, um, you don't want to keep it, say, like in a glass container where um, light can get to it because, you know, um, prolonged exposure to light for seeds um, will begin to degrade them and damage them. Um, you know, I mean, you, you think about seeds in nature, you know, where are they? They're either in a pod most of the time or they're in the soil, you know, they're not just out there exposed to light a lot of the time or they're in the, you know, they're in the hole, they're in the husk. So um, so you want to put them in some kind of opaque, um, airtight container and you want to keep it um, cool and dry. You don't want it to expose to, um, to a lot of extreme temperatures up and down, up and down. So probably like your garage, especially if you live like we're here in Alabama. So like I'm not keeping mine, you know, like in a garage or, you know, in a place to where it has no temperature control because it it's going to just bake out there and so the seeds would probably not be viable for nearly as long I keep mine in a temperature controlled area to where it's low humidity and it's you know between 65 to 75 degrees year-round so I did have uh, one last question or maybe more of a comment just to hear your thoughts about it um, I know freeze drying can help preserve the nutrient density of foods. And I just wanted to know what are your thoughts on like freeze drying microgreens in order to distribute them further, like making them into powders for nutrient dense smoothies, for example. 
Yeah, so um, the guy that I, um, the chef that I actually trained under, that that was um, a venture he was actually considering doing. The only issue with that, I mean, it does, you're, you're completely right as far as it preserving the nutrients, it would. So um, that nutrient density would, would be preserved in the freeze drying just because it, it freezes it so instantaneously. It doesn't have time to you know degrade the nutrients um, like it would if you were slowly freezing it. But um, the problem is, is you just need so much of it in order um, to freeze dry it. Like if you're going to you know distribute it, right? In order to, to do a powder. And so, um, you know, obviously if you're growing something to maturity, you're getting a lot more bulk of, out of it. And so if you're freeze drying it then and then making it into a powder, um, that's gonna go a lot further. But if you're growing microgreens, you're going to have to grow a whole lot more of it in order to get the same amount of bulk to freeze dry it and then to turn it into a powder. So as far as whether or not it would be um, economically viable, I don't know. You would you would have to really, 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 really have your costs down on that in order to make it viable. Is it doable from a nutrition standpoint? Absolutely. Great answer. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, one one thing I want to announce is there's a link in the chat, and we will send out an email to you. Uh, there's this website called microgreenscorner.com. It has a list of microgreen growing kits. So if you're located uh, say outside of Huntsville or in another, another country um, to get started, this is a good link, at least to know about some kits that are available. And um, we'll send out a link to some more resources, the website for Sweet City Micros and Spore and Mycelium. So stay tuned for that. And I um, really hope you like this presentation. Danica did an awesome job. Thank you for uh, doing this class. Really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. This was awesome. This was awesome. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yep. Absolutely. Our Thanks pleasure. everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you all for joining. Have, uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Yeah, look out for an email from us. I will be sending it maybe in the next couple of days. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.